My name is Maria Arquero de Alarcón, I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to be um, introducing my colleague uh, Monal Kafif uh, at UVA, and just um, welcome you all today with an extended um, set of um, uh, colleagues and, and students joining us uh, because um, they are going to be hosting um, Stefan, our guest, as part of their um, thesis reviews. And we have um, many of those students and Malcolm and probably Jose and uh, some of our colleagues uh, also joining us. I also see a lot of uh, familiar faces, um, recent grads and, and students who are considering us for next year. And this is incredibly exciting um, that you know, we can host you all to have these conversations. So here we go. Um, this, um, this is a joint series that uh, we are developing, uh, bringing together two seminars that are uh, working on urban issues. In the case of the University of Michigan, Taufman College, um, our seminar is the theories and methods of urban design. And we do exactly that. We scrutinize uh, contemporary urban practices and urban debates. And we are very excited to, um, to be part of these uh, larger conversations in which we are learning quite a lot on the work that um, colleagues, practitioners, um, educators, are, are developing. I also want to welcome everyone specifically because we have an extended group of um, in the audience tonight. Actually, also a lot of our CSIS students are joining in. Um, a lot of them are dealing with the concept of how to design comments. And I think uh, Stefan's contribution will be very exciting in this context. So as Maria said, my name is Mona al -Kafif. I'm an associate professor and the director of urban design here at UVA. And one of our <clears throat> one of the seminars that I'm teaching in the urban design certificate curriculum is called urban strategies. And in this seminar, we are basically looking at the design of the urban through a lot of different scales, starting with the regional frameworks of larger metropolitan areas, and then stepping down through master plan, etc., um, to the point where we will talk where we talk a lot about tactical operations and the moment where the top down and the bottom up is meeting each other um, and we are at the moment exactly in this part uh, in the seminar so all of the lectures that we heard the last two weeks and also stefan's contribution is go going to be very exciting in this context so maria and i framed the lecture series uh, owning up to the urban this own up to uh, in brackets, which means on the one hand side, we understand the planet is urbanizing, so we need to own up to the fact that our a lot of our environments are going to be urban, so we have to design them in a more careful, more sustainable and more just way. Um, we also want to discuss the term of owning or the right to the city and who's actually shaping and making the city um, and what is the what is the probability of uh, multi authorship and having multiple voices in this process. And in this context, we basically invited a series of thinkers, designers, uh, uh, educators who are taking on this task. And, you know, a lot of them are not receiving the assignments from the planning department or from any clients. They are actually carving out these agendas and they are developing these prototypes or these, these projects um, in a one-to-one -one scale. So this is very exciting to us and we hope that the students are really picking up on this agency to uh, get the foot into the door and sometimes you have to create your own assignment to improve the urban environment. Um, we created a series of five questions that helped us to also compare the different speakers and discussions afterwards and um, yeah I'm handing it over to uh, Maria again. So just to bring all uh, the speakers uh, together um, so that we can, uh, in a way, um, establish this common ground for, for our conversations, we share, um, as Mona is suggesting, um, these uh, different points to, you know, to bring us um, a sense of how they, they actually work, how they develop their, their projects. The first one has to do with um, you know, the agency of the designer. In, in urban work, and we are very much interested in learning on how they actually define their way of working. Is this about solving problems? Is this about defining the problems so that you know we can actually start, you know, creating the tools and equipping us with with the ways of um, moving forward? Is this about making projects? Is this about um, theorizing on you know some of the new urban conditions that we see? 
We also ask them, you know, how they actually work. It's about repairing, it's about innovating, it's about serving and healing. Are there empirical urbanists uh, observing the city as found and then, you know, proposing ways forward? We are very much interested in discussing the methods, the hows, right, the, the ways of working, um, and, and how those are actually shaping projects that in many cases have a, a longevity, right? It's about the long durée of how we engage with place and we engage with many different actors. Actors in themselves, that's a very important um, question or, or you know, point for debate, how we are actually reaching out um, all the right um, partners, collaborators, uh, how we create coalitions, how we persuade, how we instigate. Those are um, critical to not only implementing, but actually sustaining many of the projects that we are discussing. Of course, we want to know about funding, how we are actually funding the work. And last but not least, as every good design and every good research, we want to know if the projects are actually replicable. Are they easily transferable? Can we scale them up? Can we scale them down? And this brings us to a discussion that is a pretty recurrent theme about uh, the qualities of our work as being prototypical, being site-specific, a combination of both. Those are some of the points that, that you know we want to use to instigate a conversation for our guests to, to help us. Um, see through their work, uh, other ways of working and, and other ways of uh, contributing to the urban. Okay, so for everyone who's new, our students obviously are aware of the lecture series, but for everyone who joins us the first time, uh, please um, do this again over the next week. We have a series of, uh, of seven lectures lined up and Stefan Gruber is tonight in the center point, uh, which is actually a very beautiful place to be. Um, and we have a series of lectures following in the next weeks, uh, all of them on Thursday evening, except for Nada Nafe, who's going to present her project on informal pattern language in Cairo on a, on a Wednesday uh, on uh, April 14th at one o'clock. Um, with this, I want to move forward to introducing our student moderators. We have, as we mentioned, Stefan Gruber with us today. And Abigail, Pete, Pavrisa, and Gigi are going to moderate the session. Um, they are going to take over the stage from now. And um, we want to thank Karim again for being um, the moderator of the moderators uh, and taking care of all of the tech components tonight. OK, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Abigail, a student moderator from UVA, like Nana said. Um, and I'm going to introduce Stefan. Stefan Ruper is a registered architect and associate professor in the Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. He serves as track chair of Master of Urban Design at Carnegie Mellon and is also the founder of Studio Gruber. His work spans multiple disciplines, including architecture and urban design, with a focus on top-down planning and bottom-up implementation and transformation that works towards equitable space for urban communities. Some of his work includes Hiding in Plain Sight, a small pedal-powered pop-up movie theater. This piece makes people into actors and passively watching a screen into an active, engaged activity while allowing bystanders to watch on and wonder about the nature of public space, energy consumption, and activity. A public consumption of media and a street-level community attraction, it has elements of similarity to Praxis in San Francisco from last week's lecture by Douglas Burnham. In Stefan's various scales of work, this one is on the smaller scale, but it has a huge reach due to the temporary mobile, mobile nature of this installation. Others of his work is on a larger scale to accommodate more people and gatherings, such as the Tischlen Deck Na <laughs> and sorry if I messed up the pronunciation of that. Um, now I'll pass it on to Stefan for his lecture, Design for a Commons Transition. Uh, hello everyone, um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thank you uh, Mona and Maria for um, inviting me and um, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. Uh, thanks uh, Abigail for the wonderful introduction uh, and everyone else who's contributed uh, to making this uh, possible. 
Um, so my lecture is um, entitled Designing for a Commons Transition. And um, I hope I will answer uh, the kind of the, the prompts uh, posed uh, to me, even if not necessarily in exactly that order or always kind of explicitly. Um, as I think we've um, heard uh, already in the introduction, it's uh, it's almost become a bit of a cliche to refer to the massive scale of ongoing urbanization. But um, while our current lifestyle transcends planetary boundaries, the world population is projected to grow to 10 billion people, doubling the number of urban dwellers by 2060. Um, and sustaining their lives will require us uh, I believe to radically rethink how we live, uh, how we share and govern resources, what we produce and consume, and uh, how we care uh, for our individual community and planetary well-being. So in um, the coming decades, uh, I think three main challenges will determine uh, our urban future. Obviously, climate change is confronting us with the finite resources uh, of planet Earth and irreversibly disrupting its ecosystem. Uh, automation and artificial intelligence uh, will defy the notion of um, earning a living or, or redefine the very idea of work, um, basically what it means to be productive. Um, and last but not least, uh, growing inequity is sharpening uh, social polarization and uh, tipping the equilibrium of the prevalent economic and political system we uh, currently live in. And you know, I, I trust that in this audience, I don't need to linger uh, on framing any of these uh, problems as such, but um, I think nonetheless, it's, uh, it's worthwhile emphasizing that uh, these wicked problems uh, uh, seem overwhelming within of themselves, but uh, on top of that, mutually reinforce one another, especially when we consider questions of equity. Uh, and together, they urge us to reflect uh, on the agency of design and ask some of the pertinent questions that Maria and Mona uh, shared uh, with us as a prompt uh, to this lecture series. Now, uh, before I dive into these issues, I, I, I wanted to pause and share a bit of a, a personal uh, experience. Um, I uh, studied architecture and urban design in the mid 90s in Aachen. Uh, actually, Mona and I uh, briefly overlapped. Uh, and there was a time when most young architects flocked to Berlin to participate in its critical reconstruction, that was the term, uh, after the fall of the wall. Um, Emerging from a turbulent history and 50 years of isolation, um, architecture was seen as a vehicle to revive the city's past splendor. Meanwhile, this picture that you see here shows uh, Berlin's Leipziger Platz, um, the, the square, uh, 20 years later. And you can see kind of an incomplete master plan conceived with the ambition of uh, creating a new center for Germany's capital, um, supposedly Europe's economic powerhouse. So, this is an image that has kind of uh, stuck with me for a long time and I think uh, raises questions about, uh, you know, these, these circus, circus tents that are kind of um, placed here originally just for a couple of weeks, but uh, uh, were there for many years. I think really kind of uh, ask questions about the state of urbanism and the efficacy of um, the methods and tool that we use uh, uh, to transform our cities. And what does it also mean that uh, in the decades following the fall of the wall, despite massive construction and developments across Berlin, its identity was ultimately uh, defined by DIY projects, uh, such as community gardens, informal bars, co-housing projects, operating in the cracks, eluding the influence of the market or the state. In effect, uh, be it the saturated European city, uh, sprawling suburbs, shrinking post-industrial cities, uh, or informal settlements, I would argue that most contemporary urban conditions render the modernist master plan ineffective in addressing contemporary challenges. And yet architecture continues to linger in the twin fantasies of order and omnipotence, uh, claiming that big problems require big plans suggesting that there is a technological fix or lamenting that um, the lack of progress is not due to a lack of solutions, but a lack of funding or political will. 
Now, if uh, Le Corbusier might have been surprised uh, but what but what has become of the contemporary city, uh, you can see him up here kind of uh, looking at the scenery, we can actually no longer pretend uh, that we had not been warned. Uh, already in 1995, uh, Rem Kohlhaas observed in uh, whatever happened to urbanism, we were making sandcastles, now we swim in the sea that swept them away. Little did he know how literal his idiom would come to affect Manhattan, the city that he so badly wished um, he would have designed himself. And Kohlhaas in this essay concludes um, that um, if there is to be a new urbanism, it would be based on the staging of uncertainties. Now, if Kohlhaas and with him an entire generation of architects have taken that uncertainty as a pretext to merely be a surfer on the wave, this is a term that he uses, our generation, and in particular your generation, can no longer deflect the challenges that stare us in the face. And because climate change unfolds along an exponential curve, just like all of these curves that describe the Anthropocene age on this slide, I will argue uh, we have to become at once much more radical in terms of the change that we aspire to and simultaneously more humble in um, how we approach and begin implementing our visions. And so these two aspirations, um, have guided my work um, of the past over the past decade, uh, and will also structure uh, today's presentation in two parts. Um, in the first part, I will uh, outline how we might begin to envision a radically different world uh, and engage in what I uh, refer to as a commons transition. Um, and I use the term radical here in the kind of in the kind of in, in the original sense, uh, the Latin sense of going back to the, the very roots of the problems we face. Um, this work is based um, on the well-known premise that problems cannot be solved with the same thinking that created them in the first place. Thus, a critical examination of uh, current forces at play in shaping the built environment, um, an attempt of rendering visible and connecting uh, alternative modes of practice, and uh, finally, an attempt to develop uh, a kind of an emergent theory on commoning the city. And um, I will reflect on that kind of that that um, in, uh, on these um, questions uh, mainly by uh, sharing with you a long-term curatorial research project entitled "An Atlas of Commoning." Um, in a second part, um, the more humble part, uh, I will then share some uh, examples uh, of tactical and incremental uh, approach on how such principles might be put into practice um, and uh, uh, begin to reframe our sense of design agency. Um, but while uh, we're still kind of on this slide about the Anthropocene, I also uh, briefly wanted to refer to Bruno Latour, the French uh, sociologist. Uh, Bruno Latour argues that uh, we have probably never been modern in the first place, as the distinction between nature and culture never existed and only misled us to believe uh, we can live from the earth. Uh, extracting its resources akin to absentee landlords uh, rather than finding uh, ways to inhabit the earth. And as a result, contemporary architecture, I think, uh, has increasingly been reduced uh, to a commodity uh, in generic urban developments, as you see on one side of the slide, or instead to signature icons competing for uh, symbolic capital in a global attention economy. Here, urbanization serves to satisfy the compound growth rate of capital in a self-amplifying uh, feedback loop. Um, and I show, uh, you know, Zaha's luxury condominium along the High Line here. Um, it's also a, a project that I actually worked on uh, during for, for the competition early on in my career. So uh, by no means uh, do I kind of uh, deem myself innocent in this uh, in this. Uh, practices and processes. Now, uh, in his um, seminal work, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, um, the, the French economist Thomas Piketty 
uh, demonstrate how the pure rate of return on capital has risen much faster than the rate of growth since the 1980s um, and has led to this exponential wealth gap uh, that, is unlike, that is unlikely to self-correct. Um, the data demonstrate that rising inequity is systemic to the workings of neoliberal capitalism. And unless markets are regulated uh, and we tackle questions of social polarization and inequity in cities, any other efforts towards sustainable urban development uh, will be made in vain. Um, the typical response to this dilemma is to call for uh, more government regulation. And that's been in a way what uh, we have uh, experienced uh, in, in the past, but in many ways, this would also mean uh, kind of an attempt of going back in time. Uh, meanwhile, more and more voices um, suggest uh, that we are moving beyond the state or the market paradigm into a, a next economy that is broadly referred to as the civic uh, commons paradigm. Now, the growing anxieties and social polarizations that we are currently experiencing in this country, but quite frankly, uh, in many parts of the world, um, are, are probably just the symptoms of such a kind of a major phase transition. Um, and as we enter what Jeremy Rifkin describes, the third industrial revolution, um, and move from the market paradigm to the commons paradigms, inevitably prevailing power structures are shaken and our social contracts uh, will be renegotiated. Um, this quote uh, by Sonia Renee Taylor uh, in response to the pandemic, uh, I think really uh, captures or emphasizes how, uh, if anything, the pandemic uh, has probably just rendered visible uh, the already existing uh, systemic uh, uh, flaws. Um, and you could argue that uh, uh, as much as we face a climate uh, crisis, a financial crisis, a political crisis, and now a health crisis, we are also facing a crisis of imagination, the kind of the ability to imagine other possible worlds uh, beyond capitalism. Now, um, it is... Um, in search for kind of early manifestations of such paradigm shift that uh, my work and my research over the last seven or eight years have increasingly focused on the commons. Uh, uh, in the background, you see a, a poster of a first international summer school that I co-organized in, in, in Vienna, Austria in 2014. Uh, and it was really kind of uh, an important um, Kind of experience for me and uh, uh, really changed uh, the, the focus of my work. Um, amongst others, this has also led me uh, to co-create uh, an Atlas of Commoning uh, and a traveling exhibition by IFA, the German Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations, um, uh, and curated in collaboration with Eich Plus, which is a Berlin-based architecture journal. Um, and um, the uh, Masters of Urban Design program that I uh, chair here at CMU has been a, a, a research partner um, uh, throughout. So uh, many students have also contributed and uh, been part of this, um, this collaborative effort. Um, the Atlas uh, assembles grassroots in initiatives in which citizens come together pool resources and self-organize in pursuit of a more sustainable and uh, solidary life. Pressured by the growing realization that neither the state nor uh, the market are able to support the even distribution and access to resources, uh, citizens around the world are taking matters into their own hands um, and uh, are claiming their right to the city. Now, the creative insights emerging from these practices of commoning offer an entry point uh, for refuting the neoliberal mantra, there is no alternative, uh, and spur the imagination of uh, uh, all kinds of possible uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, more importantly, um, these projects and the exhibition as a whole uh, tries to kind of uh, show that these alternatives actually already exist. Um, so it's not a kind of a uh, uh, a, a kind of a distant kind of uh, imagination or, or desire. Uh, and even though deceptively uh, marginal, uh, at least according to um, uh, 
current uh, market measures, when seen together, they, they form a network and already constitute a, a critical mass. So in many ways, this is a kind of the hypothesis of the, the exhibition that uh, we're trying to kind of actually show that when, when we think of them as a network, uh, that, that they already kind of uh, um, uh, point towards uh, maybe kind of uh, uh, an emergent uh, behavior and to a certain extent, that might also uh, address some of the questions about scaling uh, that, 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 that were raised earlier on. So um, the projects, uh, and I mean, um, well, let, let me make sure, uh, jump ahead um, and maybe take a, a, a little uh, pause here and try to, um, just define or describe what, what do I actually mean when I speak of commons or uh, the, the verb commoning. Commoning is understood as a collective uh, practice structured around the stewardship uh, of shared resources. Commoners uh, form self-defined communities by actively engaging in the production and self-governing governance uh, of material or immaterial common goods. Um, and so beyond uh, just uh, natural resources, um, such as commons are often kind of traditionally understood like uh, grazing land or forestry or fisheries. Uh, uh, they are not just uh, a, a resource to be found, extracted and consumed, but are actually rather framed, especially when we think about commons in the city as an ongoing social practice. Um, and this is also the reason why I favor the, the active verb commoning, uh, because it implies that actually without that stewardship, that, that continuous production and reproduction, um, the commons actually do not exist. Um, and finally, although often driven by everyday needs, maybe even um, kind of everyday survival, uh, commoning aims at a paradigm shift, a system level change towards a, a post-capitalist and pluriverse society. Now, as to be expected, the process of emancipation from uh, existing uh, power structures and the articulation of uh, individual interests uh, in order to constitute uh, a common uh, interest is, is never free of friction. So uh, I think this is also important to kind of stress that there is not a kind of a nostalgic idea of community in, in, in the commons. Uh, in fact, it, 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 the the, the, progress, the process of encountering and negotiating differences is, is, is probably at the, the, the heart uh, of uh, how, where practices of commoning unfolds. And according to that logic, uh, the exhibition is also structured around uh, three, uh, what we call axes of tensions. Um, um, these are ownership axes, production and reproduction and right and solidarity. Um, And these tensions, um, I will kind of uh, explain them a little more in, in depth uh, in, in a minute, uh, really, I think, uh, try to um, uh, map out uh, the contested fields uh, in which also sometimes uh, contradictory uh, ideologies uh, uh, kind of um, claim and reclaim the idea of the commons. Um, and so, the spectrum of projects that are featured uh, in the exhibition uh, are pretty kind of broad. Um, uh, they range from uh, projects like the German uh, Mietshäuser Syndicate, Tenement Syndicate, uh, that is working towards permanently removing uh, housing or, or residential property from the real estate market um, uh, to, um, you know, also kind of um, other projects uh, that are, are, are maybe more kind of more controversial, such as the Yoshino uh, Cedar House, uh, and I'm seeing that I'm missing the slide here, uh, in uh, rural Japan, in, in which uh, a, a kind of a rural community is wrestling uh, with uh, um, a gift uh, by uh, Airbnb uh, and uh, uh, the questions of um, uh, hospitality. Now, um, because basically um, there's kind of very um, kind of contrasting positions within the atlas, I think it's important to emphasize that 
Um, the, the, the attempt here is not uh, really to um, kind of um, produce a kind of a singular definition or understanding of the commons, but much rather um, um, of create a platform for kind of the uh, exchange and, and, and the negotiation of, uh, of uh, understanding the commons today. Um, the exhibition opened in uh, Berlin um, now two and a half years ago and then uh, traveled uh, to Pittsburgh uh, and will continue traveling for uh, eight years. Uh, it was supposed to be in Mexico City uh, last summer. Uh, it's been kind of uh, sitting in storage uh, since COVID, uh, but we are hopeful that it will be in Buenos Aires uh, in October and then uh, Montevideo and Curitiba and then continue to Asia and Africa. And, um, one of the kind of key ideas about uh, the, 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 the Atlas is uh, that it's conceived as a kind of a growing knowledge archive to which new case studies are added uh, in each host city so that it will really kind of expand. And if you imagine it, we add, I don't know, between 12 and 20 case studies every year. I mean, we will have a kind of a significant pool of kind of uh, uh, projects and also insights uh, at, at the end of this. Um, the idea of the Atlas is inspired by uh, Abi Warburg, the, the German uh, art historian and, and curator who uh, developed this idea of the Nemosin Atlas in which he visually juxtaposed uh, diverse artworks aiming at teasing out differences and uh, commonalities. And this is uh, important because um, as the exhibition travel and is being continuously uh, reconfigured or, or, or renegotiated, we also really um, invite uh, a kind of a critical reflection on uh, the power relationships at play when we research or uh, produce new knowledge um, uh, and uh, therefore uh, you know want to in a way also uh, kind of uh, invite uh, uh, other uh, contributors uh, uh, to reframe or even decenter the kind of the, the, the starting point of this exhibition. So we really think of it as something that is alive and that's why it's also called an atlas and not the atlas as kind of a singular kind of uh, thing. Now, um, what, what's probably kind of uh, 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 interesting uh, for you as, uh, as students is also to kind of uh, explain that this is embedded in a in a broader uh, kind of uh, year-long thesis or research-based design studio called Commoning the City, um, in which in fact the, the, the case study research uh, done by the students is actually only kind of a stepping stone towards then uh, individual uh, thesis projects, but uh, nonetheless framed around uh, a kind of a shared uh, questions, uh, uh, set of questions uh, about the negotiation of top-down planning and, and, and bottom-up transformation and the agency of, of uh, citizen-led uh, initiatives. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the studio, students analyze and document uh, uh, selected case studies by means of uh, field work, interviews, secondary research. We've traveled uh, quite a bit uh, when it was still possible. Uh, and then kind of synthesize uh, they're kind of more expensive, extensive uh, research in this uh, uh, cons consistent uh, kind of uh, drawing collages that are these uh, takeaway posters in, in the exhibition. Um, in addition to the, the kind of central display that, that constitutes the Atlas, there's a, a whole range of other um, uh, media uh, that offer a bit of more tangible kind of uh, entry point to the commons debate to a wider audience. So there's these very large models that were developed uh, by students of the Technical University in Berlin. Um, there is a whole series of uh, video interviews uh, um, with, with uh, stakeholders. Uh, there's uh, thematic islands that position the case studies in a broader historical and societal Kind of context. Uh, and there's also a, a series of um, artistic uh, positions. But maybe uh, most importantly uh, is, is the, the fact that we really kind of uh, try to kind of think of this exhibition as, as I mentioned, a platform for exchange where architects, activists, community groups can actually uh, learn uh, from one another. So uh, in each uh, kind of uh, host uh, venue, we we organize a series of you know, conversations 
uh, when we, it was in Pittsburgh, there was really also an opportunity to bring uh, people, uh, communities uh, to campus that maybe typically don't come uh, to our uh, gallery, uh, but also take students obviously to uh, the streets and uh, uh, the initiatives. So there's also an idea of kind of uh, a, a mutual exchange here. Now, um, in, um, this gives you a little bit of a, an impression of the, the exhibition as a whole. Uh, and, but what I would like to try to do in a, in a bit of a tour de force in, in the next uh, few minutes is to try to distill uh, 10 principles, uh, kind of uh, initial principles uh, that, that I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering and uh, uh, while doing this uh, work that might give you a little uh, kind of a deeper sense of uh, what some of these initiatives have in common and, and how that might over uh, time lead to a kind of uh, a, a theory about uh, what it would mean to common the city. Um, and also it was kind of, you know, like a, 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 a very kind of uh, basic uh, uh, premise that uh, the commons challenge the binaries of public versus private space uh, and direct uh, our attention to the power relationship that I play uh, in defining the use, access, and making of spaces. Now, as uh, we are all aware, uh, since or with neoliberalism, cities have increasingly shifted away from a redistributive uh, towards an entrepreneurial mode of governing. Um, and as a result, uh, governments now often act hand in hand with the market instead of uh, in the interest of the common good. Um, and in effect, uh, the public, such as in public interest design, for instance, is highly contested uh, field that actually calls uh, for scrutiny. This is one of the reasons I have also issues with this idea of public interest uh, uh, design, because it suggests that the public interest is given uh, and not uh, the product of a, a kind of uh, a, 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 a negotiation uh, process. So the commons are really shaped through collective actions and seek to constitute common interests beyond the authority of the state or influence of the market, the private or the public. Um, ultimately, uh, or related to that, uh, is the question of uh, who holds decision-making powers. Uh, and um, Commoning is based on uh, ideas of self-governing uh, and uh, the, the, the premise that a sharing power actually requires a plan. So it's not happening just uh, uh, coincidentally. And this is uh, probably one of the most uh, kind of prominent uh, commons uh, scholars, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who won uh, a, a, a Nobel Prize in alternative economics uh, for her research on uh, uh, commons. Uh, and she advocates that there is no reason to believe that bureaucrats or politicians, no matter how well meanings are better at solving problems than the people on the spot who have the strongest incentive to get the solution right. Now, as to be um, uh, expected, uh, and I've mentioned that before, um, the, that these processes of kind of uh, sharing actually uh, are actually, are, are loaded uh, with uh, uh, antagonism, and uh, but commoning sees uh, these these uh, differences uh, uh, not necessarily um, um, as a a problem, but on, on the contrary, as a kind of a, a central uh, a, a, as a, as a process of actually. Uh, making uh, different, taking different differentiated positions and choosing between real uh, alternative. Uh, so differences here are not necessarily seen as a threat, but really as constitutive uh, to democratic processes. Um, commoning uh, takes back the economy and tries to reframe uh, prosperity without growth. Uh, and here, I think it's really important uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, capitalism's dependence on growth on the long term uh, makes uh, it kind of uh, incompatible uh, with uh, claims of sustainability and equity. Uh, and 
here, uh, uh, one kind of uh, strong source of inspiration has been the work of uh, J.K. Gibson Graham, um, who describe mainstream economics as merely the tip of the iceberg kept afloat by a much larger and more diverse set of economic uh, transactions, even though these are not kind of monetary transactions. And I, I think that if you think about things uh, like volunteering, mutual aid, and so on, uh, I think that the, the, the pandemic has definitely uh, put uh, these, uh, these, these practices into the, the, the foreground as essential to kind of our economic, although they are, they are obviously not uh, valued as such. Um, I'm skipping over some of these projects, but um, they're kind of uh, explained more in detail in the atlas. Now, commoning then starts with the social reproduction of everyday life. And I think this is uh, really essential uh, to kind of understand that the political is not just to be found uh, on the square, uh, but in fact, in the intimacy of the domestic. Uh, and especially as we kind of face a, a, a broken uh, planet, architects have to reframe their practices increasingly around questions of uh, stewardship, maintenance, care, and reproductive uh, labor. Obviously, this also kind of uh, directs our attention to uh, kind of gender uh, roles uh, and, uh, and power structures. And so I think that main, like issues like maintenance and repair uh, uh, form in a way the, the, the point zero of a commons uh, transition. Now, as part of the attempt of also uh, reclaiming uh, the economy or taking back the economy, uh, I think we need to uh, uh, increasingly uh, uh, reframe um, our homes, neighborhood, and cities uh, 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 through the lens of the use value uh, of the communities they serve instead of an investment vehicle in the real estate market. Um, and this will um, require us to find strategies uh, to decommodify both land uh, and housing and uh, explore new or alternative forms of collective uh, ownership and localized governance. Uh, this is one of the this tenements syndicate that I mentioned that um, has a, a very similar logic than, uh, for instance, community land trusts uh, in the US. Now, as we shed the material burdens of ownership, we are also increasingly entering a culture of access, uh, partly to the ubiquitous technologies that are available to us. I think this has opened up uh, new ways of accessing ideas, goods, and services, and uh, suggests that sharing is no longer necessarily associated with personal sacrifice, on the contrary. Uh, and obviously, from an environmental point of view, kind of the sharing of uh, resources or accessing them on demand, uh, I think, uh, um, offers new kind of forms of also collective uh, living or cohabitation. One, one of these examples is, uh, is to be found in, in many cooperative housing projects, uh, such as uh, Spreefeld uh, in, in, in Berlin, uh, where the private uh, footprint of dwellings is increasingly kind of, uh, or is reduced in exchange for accessing uh, shared facilities and abundance of shared facilities. Um, but also I think we are kind of facing the challenge of uh, uh, claiming the benefits of the so-called sharing economy. So there's this tendency of obviously, uh, again, kind of uh, 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 a hyper-capitalist culture in, in which even the sharing is, is, is commodified. Uh, um, and uh, here, I think it's really interesting to, to, to follow uh, initiatives around uh, uh, platform cooperativism, uh, in, in which uh, uh, the, 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 the platforms are actually putting uh, control into uh, kind of a, 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 the, the hands of uh, uh, the, the gig workers or peer-to-peer or -peer, uh, uh, organizations. Now, as we move from a linear extractive industry to or industries to a circular and regenerative uh, economies, uh, localized communities will increasingly consume what they produce and produce uh, what they consume. 
And for architects, this means that we also uh, will likely kind of uh, shift uh, away from obsessing uh, about the new and focus uh, on uh, life cycle analysis, adaptive reuse, uh, and uh, uh, regenerative uh, materials. But this does not necessarily imply that uh, we are returning to kind of a, a, a pre-industrial uh, idea of localism, a cosmo-localist future, or what uh, Ezio Manzini calls uh, cosmopolitan localism, uh, will be small, local, open, and uh, network. And so he kind of suggests that while design, engineering, and problem solving increasingly occur in uh, global open source networks, uh, production will be increasingly uh, local and uh, distributed. Um, but what uh, I think makes uh, these networks uh, uh, resilient and kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, promising is, is that they will kind of, or can mutually uh, support one another. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, um, Zurich uh, highlighting uh, the, 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 the 5,000 uh, uh, dwelling units in, in cooperative housing that have actually been built uh, within the last 10 years. Um, and really kind of, uh, I think, give us a sense how, uh, in a way, self-organized uh, or initiated projects uh, can also grow and uh, kind of uh, achieve a kind of a, a, a quite a, 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 a scale to begin to also have a kind of a systemic uh, in effect, in this case, on uh, the housing market uh, of one of the most expensive uh, cities in the world. And finally, uh, point 10, uh, precisely because of their localized and self-determined character, uh, I think it's really um, important to emphasize that practices of commoning are diverse and specific to their socio-cultural milieu. Um, I've mentioned there is no single definition of uh, commoning. Um, and so I think that if uh, other worlds are, are possible, they will emerge from a plurality of uh, practices of viewpoints that will be both old and new, indigenous uh, and uh, from urban communities, uh, feminist and environmental movements uh, alike. And here, um, I think Arturo Escobar's work is uh, really inspiring because uh, he uh, challenges us uh, to think about a commons transition uh, beyond uh, uh, modernist anthropocentrism uh, and beyond a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a singular modes of, of thinking and emphasizing a kind of a, a, a decolonizing uh, uh, approach to architecture or design at large uh, that is pluriverse. Um, now, I, I know that this is, uh, so as I mentioned, this is an attempt of kind of just distilling some of the principles uh, that, um, that are emerging from this case study analysis. Um, uh, and it might, uh, you know, sound uh, or come across as uh, kind of uh, too abstract or, or, or quite abstract. And um, therefore, in the second uh, part, uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, um, I would love to try to um, kind of uh, shift gears a little bit uh, and reflect uh, also on how this research and these broader questions I uh, have uh, led me to reframe my practice. Um, and uh, here the notion of participatory action research has been a, a helpful framework uh, for me um, as an approach uh, to work or research in community that emphasizes uh, participation and action. So rather than conceiving uh, of the role of uh, the researcher as a, a neutral outsider, uh, a participatory action research actually seeks to understand the world by trying to change it. Um, uh, and that change is collaborative uh, and follows or depends on reflection. Um, and my interest in coupling this notion of re reflection and uh, with action is also strongly influenced by Paulo Pereira's uh, work 
uh, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he actually describes how the notion of uh, dialogues or the dialogical are always both reflection and action um, in such a kind of radical interaction like Kotimir that if one is sacrificed, even in part, the other suffers immediately. Um, and um, so, you know, the integration of that, such a practice that kind of brings together reflection and uh, action in a, in a kind of uh, mutually kind of reinforcing uh, way might sound actually pretty straightforward, but I think it's in practice really hard. And I'm just kind of throwing some of these slides uh, on here or images on here of previous projects that I've done in my kind of early uh, career with my uh, office to also emphasize that, you know, it's uh, the kind of reframe, the, 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 the reframing of uh, my practice according to uh, this principle has, is really kind of a, uh, has been gradual and it's an ongoing uh, quest. Um, now, um, I've also, uh, in a kind of a more tangible way, uh, often describe uh, that approach as acupuncture urbanism, uh, as the performed actions uh, require a deep understanding of an urban milieu and seek strategic interventions that promise to set in motion a much longer and incremental transformational uh, process. Um, And so I'll, I'll share a couple of uh, projects uh, with you um, without necessarily kind of explaining them too much in depth. Uh, some of them are from uh, my kind of um, my studio. Uh, others are actually uh, done in, in, at the university uh, and in collaboration uh, always with uh, communities. But I want to kind of highlight a few aspects uh, each time. Um, I think that one of the kind of key of thinking about uh, uh, these uh, alternative modes of uh, practice is is uh, is conceiving or or kind of conceiving of the role of design not as delivering final products but increasingly kind of seeing it as a performative tools that uh, can uh, help bringing people together and encourage community engagement uh, kind of give. Uh, ordinary citizens a sense of agency in transforming the built environment. Um, and so design here is maybe much less an end, but a means uh, for an open-ended uh, uh, process. Um, Abigail briefly mentioned this project uh, in the introduction. This is uh, 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 the project called Hiding in Plain Sight that uh, I think also maybe uh, uh, kind of uh, emphasizes uh, temporary interventions or temporary use as, as a potential tool to kind of activate uh, uh, latent uh, spaces uh, and uh, inside community engagement. Um, so uh, Hiding in Place is this pedal powered pop-up movie theater, uh, which invites uh, passersby to kind of climb onto the bike and by pedaling, they produce enough power uh, to launch a public uh, screening. But it's also this, uh, it's, it's constructed as a bike uh, trailer that can be taken uh, uh, across the city and uh, to activate uh, these kind of latent sites. Uh, as you might all know, Pittsburgh has many vacant uh, lots. And we've been actually uh, uh, using this, not just in Pittsburgh, but uh, across the Mon Valley uh, as uh, a, a way to bring people uh, together and uh, draw their attention to uh, specific places. Uh, uh, or kind of potential uh, uh, future uh, projects. Um, it plays also with the kind of, you know, our obsession with uh, moving images, but uh, is trying to kind of activate people. So instead of passively just staring at our phone, people actually have to collaborate. It's actually really hard to produce enough energy on your own. So you actually depend on two others to kind of uh, uh, reach the level that the, the projector and the sound goes on and uh, kind of sets the, uh, the, the movies uh, in, in, into motion. And uh, um, you can also see that at night, uh, you know, it, it can open up and kind of create a, a screen for a, a, a wider audience. Um, now, um, the, the other aspects, uh, uh, 
of that work is that it, uh, or this approach is that it really focuses on trying to uh, work with uh, what is already available. Uh, and uh, as Mona also mentioned in, in, in the intro, not necessarily waiting for a client commission or kind of a, a big budget uh, to, uh, to act, uh, but uh, really try to identify uh, uh, available resources uh, and, 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 and uh, making uh, do with those. This is a project uh, uh, that I did, uh, maybe the oldest project uh, uh, 11 years ago at the Academy of Finance in Vienna. Um, um, and uh, here it was, uh, or the, it was actually in response to the fact that the, the main building, the historic building on the Ringstraße uh, was going to be renovated uh, for uh, you know, three or four years. Uh, and so the university was actually looking uh, for an alternative uh, venue. And together with, stu with students, we began to imagine how the need for temporary kind of uh, alternative space might also prevent a, uh, an opportunity uh, to address other uh, urban uh, problems, uh, namely the, the many vacant uh, storefronts that exist in, in some of uh, Vienna's uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and so we began to imagine uh, 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 these vacant stores as a kind of a decentralized uh, university. Uh, the idea that instead of the ivory walls, higher education or especially architecture education would kind of uh, confront real uh, everyday life uh, and uh, spread out. And so uh, we developed a, a, a kind of a, a master plan uh, uh, how to activate some of these vacant uh, shop, but also articulate possible synergies between uh, existing uh, neighborhood uh, initiatives. Uh, and Instead of drafting this vision uh, only on paper, uh, basically the studio then began to test some of these ideas uh, in a kind of a more performative uh, mode. Uh, and here are some shots of our final reviews that uh, took place with a, a much broader public uh, uh, in uh, some of these spaces. Uh, um, temporarily kind of opening up vacant stores or activating uh, some of the uh, public uh, spaces. Um, another point that I want to emphasize is the kind of the notion of uh, participation and community engagement. Um, I think that uh, these terms have become ubiquitous, um, but um, I've become interested in what does it actually mean to uh, design a process in which future users really kind of share a true sense of collective uh, ownership. Um, and uh, one project that uh, kind of uh, had this question at, at, its, at its core uh, is um, um, uh, Tischlein deck dich. The, the English term is the wishing table, uh, if, uh, because uh, Abigail was struggling with the, the English term. Uh, this was a, a project that was uh, uh, initially uh, uh, triggered by an invitation of the, the, uh, uh, the Bauhaus uh, Dessau Foundation uh, because their canteen was going to be renovated uh, and they were looking for an alternative uh, kind of uh, temporary alternative. Uh, and so the wishing table is a public installation that is uh, part farm, part outdoor kitchen uh, and part uh, dining table. Um, but I think that the important or the, the more interesting for us was uh, this idea of uh, kind of how to think about the commons as shared resource and experimenting with the idea of crowdsourcing as a way to incite uh, the kind of exchange between strangers. Um, so the entire project was actually based on an idea of gift. Um, uh, there was, uh, I think, uh, I mean, all of these projects actually are, are, are done on, on on minimal kind of uh, funding. Uh, uh, and we started a, a crowd found funding campaign, uh, um, inviting uh, residents of Dessau to contribute to the project uh, by handing out these felt bags uh, and asking for planned donations. Uh, and so at the beginning, we also didn't know how large this table was going to be. It was completely kind of dependent on the response, right? And this was an interesting feedback also to see, you know, how are actually people kind of embracing that? Uh, on top of that, 
all the other kind of materials were uh, recycled or donated uh, and uh, the construction work took place uh, with volunteers, uh, students who spent the summer uh, at the Bauhaus, but also uh, neighbors uh, 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 around the Bauhaus. Um, and so um, the, 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 the collective actually kind of making of, uh, I mean, literally building and uh, 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 the, 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 this project uh, really was, I think, uh, transformative in, in giving a, a sense of uh, kind of ownership uh, to, you know, this, this place that otherwise very much kind of acts as a buffer between a UNESCO uh, monument and uh, uh, the, 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 the residents around it. I think it's important to emphasize that Deso is a shrinking city with an aging population. And so actually there, there is a lot of tourists that you know, visit uh, the Bauhaus, but uh, these demographics actually rarely interact. And uh, the, 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 this table was um, kind of conceived as a mixing chamber that it would bring these, these different groups uh, together. And because uh, the residents had actually kind of donated their plants, this was a, a big incentive to come back uh, and see how things were kind of growing, kind of come for uh, the harvest uh, and, and kind of stick around. So uh, there was a, a, a real kind of um, um, handover in a way to, to the community and, and also some of the students um, uh, over that, the period of that summer. Um, the last kind of point I want to make, uh, uh, and sharing two uh, projects, uh, is about also um, um, kind of longer term transformation. So the question of how do you kind of go beyond these temporary and tactical uh, initial uh, 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 catalysts. Uh, but nonetheless uh, kind of find ways of engaging uh, with community partners on, on, on a longer term uh, and can think of kind of incremental change. And uh, a lot of my more recent work and collaborations that I've been doing between the university and community groups is actually trying to find a, a mode uh, to do this. Um, this is a first project um, that I did uh, in collaboration with the Manchester Academic uh, Charter School uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Manchester is a, a, a neighborhood on the north side with uh, a pretty uh, high amount of vacant uh, lots and uh, you know, a, a neighborhood that, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, kind of struggled and experienced uh, severe disinvestment. Uh, and the school has actually kind of purchased uh, uh, the vacant lots around this, uh, their, their building originally to, to actually build a, a, an extension, but uh, then got another opportunity, opportunity and turned to us with the question, so what should we do with uh, this vacant uh, land uh, now? Um, and uh, after uh, kind of you know, initial uh, kind of more conventional investigation into the neighborhoods and the kind of its uh, economic, social, and ecological milieu, we, we, it became clear to us that we, we, we could only kind of do this project uh, actually by working with the, the, the youth, uh, the, the kids of this school. And so uh, we managed to actually, uh, as a studio with students, uh, teach a class, an elective uh, every uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, and began to uh, explore the neighborhood, uh, just learn uh, about the neighborhood with the, the, the students uh, through all kinds of different workshops, uh, kind of, and uh, exercises. And um, what was fascinating is that, you know, although we were focusing uh, or initially asked to focus on the vacant land, we soon also realized uh, all kinds of other problems uh, that the school had in terms of drop off conflicts with the neighbors and so on. And so on the one hand, we developed a kind of a, 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 a master plan or kind of a, a, a long term strategy of how to reorganize drop off and buses and all that kind of stuff. Um, we also began to work with students uh, about visions for a kind of uh, a schoolyard. Um, but um, what was, I think, uh, the, the most um, rewarding uh, part of the project was uh, uh, this discovery about their, their kind of fascination with uh, the, the porches that exist in, in 
the neighborhood and, and what role they have as a social uh, space uh, uh, and uh, for a sense of community in that neighborhood. And uh, this actually emerged in a kind of a role play that these, these two boys uh, kind of they, they enacted uh, uh, and became a, kind of a, a driving force for the, the, the rest of the studio. Uh, and so we envisioned uh, this idea of roaming porches, uh, three kind of uh, uh, classrooms that uh, that uh, you know also double as kind of wheelbarrows that could be actually kind of uh, taken around the neighborhood to activate different vacant lots, and simply begin to test what it means to, to kind of open up the school and take some uh, classes, classrooms uh, into uh, the neighborhood, uh, and uh, you know. Our students, uh, together with uh, some of this, uh, the kids, actually then kind of build uh, these uh, porches. Uh, they have different kind of functions and so on that then were uh, kind of uh, tested. And um, that's been really kind of, so uh, these porches in a way, um, they're, they're more kind of a, a vehicle to begin to create an interface between the neighborhood and the school and, uh, and open up the school without necessarily uh, yet determining uh, the, the future of these uh, the, this vacant lots. Uh, but what's been really uh, beautiful is that it's led uh, to a kind of a more, much longer uh, uh, transformation, uh, a nonprofit uh, organization called Grounded Strategies in a way has taken over from here, but they are now working on a, the, the transformation of or the building of a, a schoolyard with a playground and so on. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. I'm, I'm going to wrap up really quickly. Uh, the, the, the last and second uh, project uh, in, in this kind of strand of, of work uh, in, in Pittsburgh uh, is called, uh, is in a collaboration with uh, Community Forge. Uh, here it's actually a vacant uh, school, so uh, a, a, a school that uh, was closed because um, of lack uh, of uh, funding in uh, uh, Wilkinsburg, just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, but a group of uh, young um, um, activists have actually bought uh, these buildings uh, and are, are working on, on turning that into a kind of um, a center for uh, youth empowerment, community collaboration, uh, and also kind of uh, startup uh, incubation I was a really strong focus on, on um, um, uh, uh, community uh, governance uh, and ownership. And uh, we have been working uh, with them on uh, initially uh, focusing on um, kind of uh, transforming the, the former schoolyard. Uh, um, and uh, based on the experiences with uh, in Manchester, we kind of uh, also uh, formed a kind of, we had a number of kind of large uh, kind of community engagement session, but then uh, ended up working much more intensively on a weekly basis with a, a youth council uh, on developing uh, visions uh, for that schoolyard. And what was really beautiful is that the Community Forge, the organization, uh, based uh, or with, uh, based on our work, actually established a governance structure where the youth actually kind of make uh, decisions on their own. Uh, they have a certain budget that they can uh, kind of uh, allocate uh, and uh, really kind of are empowered to uh, make decisions. Um, and the, the kind of resulting uh, urban design uh, framework that emerged from this process is an archipelago of islands. Um, um, each island is programmed for diverse uh, activities. Um, and I, I'm mentioning this here mainly also because of this notion of incremental kind of implementation. It was clear for, from the beginning that uh, they didn't have the budget to realize uh, a large project all at once. And so uh, one of the premises was that we would have to find a, a, a design framework that would actually allow for this uh, gradual kind of uh, or incremental uh, implementation over time without necessarily always looking like a construction site or kind of, you know, and, and nonetheless adding up to, to something that, that is coherent. Um, and so the, the notion of the islands, I think, work here because although we developed um, ideas with the different stakeholders for each of these islands, uh, uh, you know, we also left some kind of more open for future unpredictable uh, use and they really kind of 
work in a kind of a, a relational way uh, that they can also change over time. But I think one thing that you know all these projects have in common is that um, it's about kind of acknowledging also participation fatigue. Uh, a lot of these uh, communities go to endless meetings and never see a result. And so kind of actually delivering a tangible result quickly and uh, early on is I think really essential to building trust and kind of creating a certain kind of uh, enthusiasm. And so, you know, again, because of limited funding and time, uh, we decided to focus on this, this play field. Uh, basically, it's just uh, a painting, uh, uh, the, the, the former schoolyard uh, with kind of a, a whole range of educational patterns uh, from kind of, uh, you know, the planetary system to chess uh, and sports and, and, and so on. Uh, and here again, I mean, the, the kind of the whole um, uh, event was very much, uh, this actually have been a video, it's somehow not playing, but uh, the, the, the painting was very much kind of, uh, in a way, uh, a collective um, a, a, a endeavor um, and what's again been beautiful, so we, we did this painting uh, uh, with the studio, but uh, in the meantime, the community has actually kind of just uh, taken on the, the, the plans and, and is continuing to kind of build uh, and realize uh, the, 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 the project uh, on their own. Um, we are now planning a kind of a second uh, studio, hopefully next spring. Uh, where the focus will be much more on the interior and kind of transforming some of their spaces. 